From the start of our marriage, I've had a hard time dealing with my mother-in-law and father-in-law. They've always treated me poorly, and to make things worse, they've constantly criticized me for not being able to have children. What hurt even more was when my husband, who should have been there for me, said, My sister-in-law is young and beautiful, and unlike you, she had kids right away. I'm honestly jealous of my brother. On top of that, my mother-in-law accused me of being infertile because she claimed I was having an affair and said she had proof from a hidden camera. So I came up with a plan. I called a family gathering, pretending it was to celebrate my nephew's birthday, and suggested we all watch the supposed evidence of my affair that my mother-in-law was talking about. When we watched it, my sister-in-law Scott and my father-in-law muttered, I knew it, in shock. My name is Emma, and I'm 36 years old. I work in the international business division of a mid-sized trading company. I live with my husband, Scott, who is the same age as me and works at a steel manufacturing company, along with my in-laws. We don't have any children yet. I met my husband at a dating event a friend invited me to. At that time, I was in my eight year on the job, finally getting the hang of it and starting to enjoy my work, so I wasn't really thinking about marriage. But I couldn't say no to my college friend, who kept insisting, you have to come. Honestly, I was more interested in the special menus the restaurants had prepared for the event than in finding someone. I felt a bit out of place compared to my friend, who was actively socializing, but it turned out she got close to a guy who was there with Scott. Apparently, Scott wasn't too interested in the event either, and had been dragged along just like me. We ended up hanging out together as bystanders, but since I thought it was just a one-time thing, I didn't exchange contact information with him. However, exactly two weeks after the event on a Sunday, I got a call from an unknown number. At first, I ignored it, but after work, the call started coming every 15 minutes. I kept wondering, who could this possibly be? I was getting frustrated and was about to block the number, but before I did, I decided to answer the call to find out who was behind it. It turned out to be Scott, the guy I had met at the dating event. He said, Oh, good, is this Emma? I was relieved to know who it was, but I was also confused because I knew I hadn't given Scott my number. When I asked him how he got my number, he casually replied, I begged a friend who was with me at the event to get it for me. Apparently, my friend had hit it off with Scott's friend and decided to start dating him after the event. Scott, who hadn't gotten my contact information, found out about this and managed to get my number by asking my friend repeatedly. Although I was a bit upset that my friend had given out my number so easily and that Scott had gone to such lengths to get it, we somehow started dating. A year later, Scott proposed to me. It wasn't a whirlwind romance, but I felt that I could live a calm and peaceful life with Scott, who had a gentle and endearing personality. There were no issues from my side about getting married. My parents had been living apart since I started college, but they hadn't divorced because they didn't see any real benefit in doing so. Friends and acquaintances would ask if I felt sad about it, but I had always felt distant from my family, so their separation seemed like it was bound to happen. During my college years, my parents supported me financially, so I would visit them alternately during long vacations. However, once I started working, I used my busy schedule as an excuse to just keep them updated through social media. When I told my parents about my marriage, they said they would attend the ceremony if there was one. But when I explained that we were just going to register the marriage without any special ceremony, they later sent me a generous sum of money as a wedding gift, which was more than enough for me. However, my in-laws, Rachel and Brian, weren't happy with how my parents handled the marriage. They said things like, to think they would settle their only daughter's marriage with money, how insensitive. They spoke in a bitter tone, which bothered me. But then Scott defended me by saying, Money is definitely a sign of love. It's ridiculous for mom, who has never worked, to say something like that. Dad should know better, considering how hard it is to earn money. Hearing him stand up for me like that made me feel truly happy that I had chosen him. But about six years into our marriage, things started to go downhill. The first sign was when I got promoted at work. I had worked hard in my department since I joined the company, and that year, I decided to take the promotion exam. When I passed the exam, they told me, Emma, you mentioned in your interview that you wanted to work globally in the future, right? How about starting in the international business division to gain some experience? I was thrilled that my hard work was recognized 
and I was excited to share the news with Scott. But when I told him, he got visibly upset and snapped at me, saying, Oh, okay. And what are you trying to say? That you've climbed the ladder and you're some big shot now. I was shocked by Scott's reaction and wondered if I had said something wrong. I quickly apologized, saying, I'm sorry, I didn't mean it like that. But Scott responded harshly, See? Playing the victim like that just proves you're looking down on me. Then he angrily threw his beer can into the trash, slammed the door, and left our apartment. He didn't come back for a week. He ignored my texts and calls, and when I called his office, they told me he was out, but at least I knew he was safe. I thought about waiting for him outside his office, but I didn't want to embarrass him. So I decided to go to my in-law's house to talk to them about what was happening. I knew they would probably blame me, but I didn't know what else to do. Even though I showed up unexpectedly, they let me in without any trouble. But as soon as I stepped into the living room, I was shocked by Scott's angry outburst. He yelled, What do you want now? Have you come all this way to mock me some more? I quickly said that wasn't my intention and that I would apologize if I had caused any misunderstanding. But Scott didn't want to hear it, and my in-laws started blaming me too. They said things like, Just because you both work doesn't mean you can act all high and mighty. Don't you know that's not how a wife should behave? This is exactly why we were against this marriage from the start. Rachel, my mother-in-law, was just as loud as Scott, cursing at me. From there, it turned into an endless lecture about how I had hurt their son's ego. No matter what I said, they blamed me for everything. Finally, they told me, Scott doesn't want to go back to the apartment you two shared. If you don't want a divorce, then move out of that apartment and come live here with us. We'll teach you how to be a proper wife. Looking back, I wonder why I didn't just agree to a divorce right then and there. But at that time, I still had feelings for Scott. Having grown up watching my parents stay married in name only, I think I was confused and didn't really understand what marriage should be. After I followed my mother-in-law's suggestion and moved out of the apartment to live with my in-laws, they were extremely pleased, and it didn't take long for me to understand why. It turned out that Scott's older brother, Charles, who was five years older, had been living with them but moved out about four months before my promotion. He had found a girlfriend and wanted to live on his own. Rachel, who had always adored Charles because he graduated from a more prestigious university than Scott, was shocked and deeply upset by his sudden departure. But the problem wasn't just emotional. Charles's leaving also meant the loss of his financial contributions to the household, which was a big issue. My in-laws are very vain and love to show off. They often host gatherings for relatives, serving expensive food and drinks. Charles's financial support had been their lifeline since my father-in-law's post-retirement job didn't pay enough to cover their lavish lifestyle. They convinced Scott, who had come home to vent, to move in with them, and that's how we ended up living together. Scott seemed to enjoy the sudden attention after always feeling overshadowed by his accomplished brother. When I realized this, it felt like I was finally seeing things clearly, but more problems were on the way. Soon after, Charles married his girlfriend, Nancy, who turned out to be quite a handful. Nancy was four years younger than Charles and three years younger than Scott and me. She appeared fragile and delicate, the kind of person who triggers protective instincts in men. This was especially true for both Brian and Scott, who became visibly restless whenever Nancy visited and acted like they were her followers. Rachel, not amused by this, began criticizing me, saying, Scott is smitten with his brother's wife because you lack charm. If you just had a child, my husband would settle down as a grandfather. She even suggested I quit my job to focus on getting pregnant. However, due to my in-laws' extravagant spending, the household expenses were skyrocketing and Scott's salary alone couldn't cover them. Even when I showed them a report from a household budgeting software to explain the situation, they dismissed it, saying, that's just because you're bad at managing money, always full of excuses. Then Nancy became pregnant. Rachel, who had previously disliked Nancy, suddenly became obsessed with her first grandchild, doting on her grandson, Andrew, immensely. She eagerly welcomed Nancy's visits, which she had avoided before, and even started saying things like, Oh, how wonderful it would be to live under the same roof as such a lovely grandchild. Scott then started making sarcastic remarks to me, saying things like, Exactly, 
Nancy is young and beautiful, and unlike you, she gave birth to a child right away. I'm really jealous of my brother, Brian chimed in. That's right. Maybe we should just kick out the daughter-in-law who can't have children and let Charles's family move in instead, he said without thinking. By then, even I started to consider that maybe leaving Scott and this house might be the best option since we didn't have children. Then, as if on cue, Nancy became pregnant with her second child. Rachel's obsession with her grandchildren grew stronger, and she started treating me even worse. She came up with a ridiculous theory and said, The reason you can't have children must be because you're having an affair. You're just worried you won't know if the child is Scott's or your lover's. I was shocked by her words and decided to ignore her. But one evening, I noticed Rachel smirking at me. Confused, I asked what was going on and she said, You are indeed having an affair, just as I suspected. When I questioned Brian and Scott about it, Rachel proudly declared, I've got proof of her affair on a hidden camera. I hired a professional, so it's foolproof, and then burst out laughing with joy. Hearing this, Brian and Scott were momentarily shocked. But then, influenced by Rachel's confidence, they said, if that's true, then it's grounds for divorce. At that point, I calmly said, understood. Then I will take this opportunity at Andrew's birthday celebration next week, which we've already planned, to explain the situation to all the relatives who will be there. The birthday celebration for Andrew, organized by Rachel, who loved to show off, turned out to be a grand event with a banquet hall and a hotel reserved just for us. The invited relatives seemed somewhat tired of Rachel's boasting but still enjoyed the food and drinks. As the party was winding down, I took the microphone to speak. Everyone turned their attention to me, wondering what was happening. I began, I apologize for interrupting your conversations, but I have a brief announcement to make to all of you gathered here today. The crowd started murmuring in confusion, while my in-laws and Scott, assuming I was about to confess and discuss divorce, smirked just like before. Charles's family, the guests of honor today, were also present. On my signal to the staff, a screen was lowered behind me, the projector was set up, and the lights dimmed. Everyone's attention turned to the screen as the video began to play. The video started with footage of a shady hotel district, and as the entrance of one particular hotel came into focus, Scott, Brian, and Nancy's faces turned pale, just as I expected. However, Rachel, unaware of what was about to happen, looked around curiously, completely oblivious to the growing tension among the two of them. Then, a clear shot captured by the camera made the entire room gasp in surprise, and for good reason. The screen unmistakably showed Nancy and Brian hugging as they left the hotel. The room fell silent as the video continued, showing them sharing lingering, passionate hugs before catching a taxi. The scene shifted to the same hotel entrance, but this time it wasn't Brian who emerged holding hands with Nancy, it was Scott. Scott, Brian, and Nancy were all frozen in place, while some of the relatives murmured, I knew it. The room erupted into whispers again. At that moment, I paused the video, turned the lights back on, and spoke into the microphone. My announcement to all of you is exactly what you've just seen. My husband Scott and father-in-law Brian have been having affairs with Nancy, Charles's wife. The evidence was meticulously recorded by the investigation company hired by Rachel. I held up a thick file of documents, which caused more gasps from the crowd. As the noise died down, I revealed that the investigation company had actually been hired by Rachel not to uncover Brian, Scott, and Nancy's infidelity, but to find proof of my supposed affair so they could kick me out. Scott must have filled her head with all sorts of nonsense, making her believe such absurd things, I said, causing the relatives to look at Scott and Rachel in disbelief. Rachel had declared victory without even checking the contents when the investigation company reported they had caught evidence on camera. Unfortunately, I have no idea about the affair Rachel accused me of. I continued, projecting a photograph onto the screen. It was a snapshot taken at the maternity hospital when Andrew was born. The photo showed my sister-in-law holding Andrew in the center, with Charles smiling beside her, and Scott and I, who had come to celebrate, in the background. Since Rachel has always disliked me, she probably didn't have a single clear photo of me. So she sent this snapshot to the investigation company, 
asking them to find evidence of the daughter-in-law's infidelity. As I explained, I briefly glanced at Rachel, who looked shocked as if I had hit the nail on the head. The investigation company, hired by Rachel, had made a mistake they thought Nancy, who was holding the child in the photo, was the daughter-in-law they were supposed to be investigating. When they started their work, they unexpectedly captured Brian and Scott repeatedly visiting the hotel with Nancy. Believing Charles to be the husband under investigation, they reported to Rachel that they had caught evidence on camera. Rachel, thinking this was proof of my alleged affair, believed she had finally found what she was looking for. When I was first confronted with the so-called evidence, I was surprised, but then something clicked. I remembered the name of the investigation company from a credit card statement that Rachel had used. Rachel, who often spent too much, had made me get her a family card to use for her purchases, just in case her own credit card limit wasn't enough. Troubled by her making large purchases without consulting me, I had set up the card statement to be viewable in an app so I could check the charges each month. The next day, I took half a day off work and went to the investigation company to explain the situation. I then commissioned a new investigation myself. Realizing their mistake, the company eagerly accepted the task to make things right, and they quickly provided the results, which led to the evidence I presented today. As the screen was removed and the lights brightened, Nancy, Brian, and Scott all looked pale. I approached the great aunt and uncle, whom my in-laws greatly respected, and said, I apologize for the inconvenience, but I prefer not to expose the children to what's about to be discussed. Could someone please take them to another room? The great aunt and uncle immediately approached Nancy, took Andrew, and handed him over to their own children. The other children were also led to another room by several women, leaving behind furious relatives, a stunned Rachel, and a bewildered Charles. Only Nancy, Brian, and Scott remained, shrinking under the stern glares of the relatives. Then, Rachel, who had been trembling, suddenly leaped towards Nancy, shouting, What have you done? Betraying me and Charles with Brian and Scott. She lunged at Nancy, but several relatives rushed to stop her. Nancy was already petrified, and Brian and Scott were similarly frightened. Finally, I decided to deliver the last blow. Given the circumstances, I will be divorcing Scott. I apologize for any inconvenience caused to everyone here. According to the investigation company, the improper relations between these two have been ongoing and not just recent. Reconciliation is impossible. I made the announcement, then pretended to stumble as I added. After reviewing the investigation results, I've been tormented by the thought that Andrew, and even the child Nancy, is currently carrying might belong to Brian or Scott. The remaining women in the room rushed over, rubbing my back and taking my arms to support me, saying to the two of them, You are all shameless and disgusting. Poor you, they started cursing. The men looked on with disdain, surrounding the two with cold stares. Brian and Scott could do nothing but stand there, silenced by the disapproval, while Rachel continued ranting and Nancy sobbed. The fallout from my revelation that day spread quickly. When Charles found out that his wife had been cheating on him with both his brother and father, he was in shock for a while. But as he started to regain his senses, he began to seriously doubt Nancy's claims that Andrew and the baby she was carrying were his. Nancy pleaded desperately, saying, That's just a lie. Both Andrew and the baby are undeniably your children. However, once suspicion takes root, it doesn't disappear easily. Taking advantage of a moment when Nancy was off guard, Charles used a paternity test kit he had ordered to check their father-child relationship, and the results came back positive. Even when confronted with the results, Nancy stubbornly refused to admit to cheating, frustrating Charles to the point where he contacted her parents. Caught completely off guard, Nancy's parents couldn't believe the story Charles told them, so they came to my office demanding an explanation. Though I found it bothersome, I knew I had to deal with this eventually, so I took the next day off and went with Nancy's parents and the couple to the law firm I had hired. When the lawyer, Richard, showed them the related documents and the infamous video, Nancy's parents were speechless. Seeing this, Charles triumphantly declared, See? I told you she betrayed me cheating with both my brother and father. It's clear neither Andrew nor the baby she's carrying are mine. 
But Richard interrupted him sharply, saying, Would you mind discussing that among yourselves? You're here not to discuss who the father of the children is, but to address the issue of child support. It was obvious that Richard wasn't taking sides, but what shocked me more was Nancy and her parents' reaction. Nancy retorted mockingly, It's your fault. Scott cheated on you because you were always working and not being attractive enough, right? It's your own doing. I calmly replied, Is that so? Then we'll have to let a third party decide. Who's right? Maybe a judge will decide. When I mentioned a trial, Nancy's parents turned pale, and it was no surprise. Both of them were teachers at a prestigious girls' school in the area, and the idea of their daughter, who was supposed to represent the ideal of a good wife and mother, being involved in such a scandal with her brother-in-law and father-in-law would ruin their reputation. As soon as they heard the word trial, Nancy's parents immediately begged, we sincerely apologize. But to me, at this stage, an apology from anyone didn't matter. I glanced at Richard and stood up, signaling the end of the meeting. Later, Richard informed me that after I left, Charles, Nancy, and her parents caused a huge uproar, but they finally left after Richard threatened to call the police. Not long after, perhaps as a way to keep things quiet, Nancy's parents transferred a large sum of money through Richard. Given how things turned out, what happened to Charles and Nancy didn't concern me much, but around the same time, I found out about the fate of my in-laws through Scott, who had also demanded a division of assets. According to Scott, Charles filed for divorce and refused to pay child support for Andrew or the unborn child unless a DNA test proved he was the father. He even declared he would file for denial of paternity as soon as the child was born. Fearing the worst, Nancy's parents, against her wishes, forced her to undergo prenatal testing. It turned out that the father of the unborn child wasn't Charles, but shockingly, it was Scott. Even more, it was revealed that Andrew's father was Brian, making the situation beyond repair. When Rachel, who had doted on Andrew, found out he was actually her husband's child, she had a mental breakdown. She aged rapidly and is now almost bedridden, with Brian taking care of her around the clock. Brian told his father-in-law, I won't look after you in your old age, get Scott to do it. Unfortunately, most of Brian's retirement funds had been spent on luxury brands and jewelry for Nancy in an attempt to win her favor, leaving almost nothing behind. As a result, with their inheritance depleted, Brian and Rachel, now abandoned by Charles, turned to Scott in desperation. But Scott, already burdened with my asset division claims, was reportedly being pressured by Nancy, who had been divorced by Charles. She was demanding that Scott marry her, insisting, now that it's come to this, you're going to take responsibility for both the unborn child and me. I'm sorry for everything that's happened. I apologize, so please give me another chance. I love you, Emma. Scott begged for forgiveness, but it was clear he wasn't seeking my love. He just wanted my financial support and someone to care for his parents for free. Since I had no lingering feelings for Scott, I instructed Richard to convey my final decision and blocked all contact with him except through one social media platform. Eventually, the divorce was finalized, despite some disputes. The asset division was paid in full in two installments. According to Richard, Nancy continued living with my in-laws, pretending to be Scott's wife, even though she wasn't officially registered as part of the family. However, once word spread among visiting relatives, the whole neighborhood began whispering about the shameless family, which drove Nancy to become a recluse. She neither helped with Rachel's care nor took care of Andrew and the newborn, leading the kindergarten to report Andrew's neglected appearance to child services. In the end, Nancy's parents took in the two children but disowned her, saying, You are no longer our daughter, and we are no longer your parents. Never show your face to us again. With nowhere else to turn, Nancy relied entirely on Scott, just like my in-laws. Scott's income alone now had to support four adults, including his mother, who needed nursing care. A colleague of Scott's, who works at the same company, mentioned that a relative at an affiliated company exaggerated the story, making Scott the target of rumors as bad as those on gossip websites. Despite the difficult situation, Scott continues to work, unable to quit because of financial needs, enduring the discomfort. For some reason, 
Charles seemed to regard us as fellow victims, but the fact remains that he looked down on me, along with Nancy and my in-laws, for being a woman unable to bear children. Naturally, I ignored him completely at work, but as rumors spread within our company, he couldn't handle the whispers and volunteered to transfer to a subsidiary in a regional area. After everything was settled on my end, I was approached about a transfer to an overseas branch. Although I had expressed a desire to work abroad during my job interview, the sudden offer caught me off guard. However, my bosses encouraged me, acknowledging the career I had built and the language skills I had continued to learn in my spare time. Feeling fed up with the rumors, much like Charles, albeit for different reasons, I decided to take the opportunity. I decided to take a bold step and accept the overseas assignment. When Scott somehow heard the news, he sent a series of cliché romantic messages, pleading for reconciliation on the only social media account I hadn't blocked him on. But since I planned to cancel my phone service when I leave the country, I chose to ignore them. Despite everything that happened, cutting ties with that in-law family feels like a stroke of luck. With this in mind, I feel ready to face any challenges that may come my way. It might seem a bit opportunistic, but that's honestly how I feel. Maybe I've been too hard on myself all this time. From now on, I plan to stay positive and give my best effort in everything I do.